Hi, my name's Mark Downs. Today, we're spending a little time on the Grand Union Canal at Hayford. This particular stretch is controlled by Northampton Neen AC. It's a super fishery, and hopefully we'll catch a few fish. Before you ask, I've got permission off the farmer to park in this particular spot. It's only a short distance into the canal. So, let's get the tackle out, and off we go. I'll see you on the bridge. Don't forget, lads, always close the gates. <coughs> Just had a chat with the farmer. Seems quite happy about the fact that we're here fishing today. But don't forget, always get permission. Whoever's land you're parking on, make sure you get the permission off, off the, whoever owns it. This looks a nice stretch of canal to our left. It's got a good record, this stretch. The only problem with it for today is it's a little bit chilly this morning. It's very shallow. I would imagine as the day goes on, you will catch quite a few fish on this particular side. I'm looking for a little bit deeper water at the moment. This is the actual towpath side itself. I would imagine it'll be a lot deeper on this particular side than the far side. But with a little bit of bankside disturbance today, I would imagine the fish might push over onto the shallows. And because this is too shallow, I don't think I'll be, hold, be able to hold the fish for too long. Today, I do, I must admit, I fancy fishing this particular side. Well, this particular peg on the, on the left hand side of the bridge looks very good. It's known as the fence end peg. In fact, a couple of weeks ago in one big competition, it, I think it, the second place angler come from this with around six or seven pound of fish. Now, I wouldn't expect to catch six or seven pound today because I think we've had a, quite a heavy frost overnight. It's a little bit chilly, but we would expect to catch a fair few fish. The secret of today's video is the fact that I'm going to fish with probably less than a quid's worth of bait. Now, for my pound today, I've ended up with a quarter pint of pinkies, half a pint of maggots, a couple of slices of bread, and a couple of three pints of ground bait. And that's not bad fishing, is it? A quid for a day's sport can't be bad. Let's go see what we can do. One little disadvantage about this peg is the fact that I'm quite high off the water and that can make, can make things a little difficult. Well, here we are, this is the fence end peg. I say it looks a particularly nice peg. It's reasonably shallow on the far bank. You can see where that fence actually comes into the canal itself. And slightly to the left, there's a few brambles, a bit of bracken, and then it goes into a little concrete run up to the bridge itself. It's not particularly deep over there, probably, hopefully, I'd, I'd like to find probably two, two and a half foot of water just short of that fence, where I would expect to catch one or two roach. Inside, I would imagine it's very deep indeed. It's probably, what, three to four, maybe even a little bit more, four and a half foot deep. There's a slight toe on the water at the moment, and I'm a little bit tempted to fish inside with the top and bottom float. If, if it slows up, I'll probably use a bottom end only float. But inside, I think I'm going to start off with a top and bottom float. All right, let's get some tackle out and get going. Fish is just top there. That's a good start. There's quite a few floats designed for canals to choose from. In fact, I've got quite a selection here. But the four types I'll be using today are very well established canal floats in, them, in their own right. The first float I'll be using is a Billy Making Canal Grey. And Billy Making has for long been one of the top canal anglers in the country. And who am I to argue with, with Billy's designs on floats? It's a superb float made at all balsa. 
And without a shadow of a doubt, bike registration is superb on these. The second float I'll be using is a Drennan canal float. However, I've modified it slightly. I've put a slightly longer cane insert in the tip. This is ideal for giving on the drop registration. And when you are catching quite a few small silverfish, by that I mean roach, they're excellent. The third float is this little midi grey. It's a very small orb balsa float and it's ideal for fishing shallow water on the far bank, especially with a pole. I don't use them very often, but when they, are, when they do come into their own, they're an excellent float. And finally, my favourite, the standard pole float with the cane insert. It's ideal for close in fishing, on the drop fishing with either bread punch, squat or pinky. Without a shadow of a doubt, it can catch you a lot of fish very quickly. Right, we're very nearly ready to start fishing now. Right, the rigs I've set up today are two three metre poles, long lined. In other words, I have three metres of pole and three metres of line. So any fish I do happen to hook will be swung directly to hand. On the first rig, I have the Billy Making Canal Grey, with the majority of the shot bulked just beneath the, flo just beneath the float for easy casting. The rest of the shot is bulked 10 inches above the hook, and then I have one very small dropper four or five inches away from the hook. And then at the hook end, I have a size 24 or 22 inch caster blue. It's a very fine wire hook. My second pole rig, I must admit, is my, it's my old favourite. It's a standard pole float with the cane insert. The whole of the bulk, in this case, is situated just 10 and 12 inches away from the hook, which is a tungsten olivet, and then I just have two number 12s as droppers beneath the bulk itself. The hook, once again, adrenaline caster blue, size 22 or 24, on a 12 ounce hook length. The third pole rig is the midi balsa float and these are ideal for fishing that far line. Again, the majority of the bulk of the shot is situated beneath the float, but equally spaced in the two foot of water I'd expect, I have two number 10s, 120 inches above the hook, 110 inches above the hook, again the same hook, a size 22, caster blue. And finally, my rod and line set off. Today I'm using a 13 foot tip action rod, although the tip is very, very soft because I don't expect to catch many big fish. A close pace reel loaded with pen and a half breaking strain Maxima line. And I must admit, I do like Maxima on canals because it sinks quite quickly. And there's nothing worse than having your line skimming on the surface drift. I have a slightly larger canal grey float with all the bulk again beneath the float, with just two very small shots down the line, a number eight, mid-depth, at about two foot above the hook, and a number 10, about 10 or 12 inches above the hook. Again, the hook is exactly the same, the 22 or 24 inch caster blue to 12 inch, to, sorry, to 12 ounce hook length. Those are our four basic rigs for today. Before we go any further, just a few words about the rod. It's a standard, carbore on 13 foot but occasionally when I go on canals I do like to fish a little bit closer in and I would like to use a 12 foot rod so to save the hassle of stripping everything down and setting a 12 foot rod up I'll simply cut a foot out of the middle of the rod like so and hey presto we have a 12 foot rod two rods for the price of one so there's my tackle that I'll be using today for fishing this particular stretch of canal. But what do you have to look for when you go to your local tackle shop to buy some fishing tackle for fishing your own stretch of local canal? First of all, reels. Any reel whatsoever will do for canal fishing. The important part is the line you actually put onto that reel. I very rarely use line over two pound breaking strain. Maybe I'm just unlucky, I don't catch very many big fish on canals. But by using line under two pound, I find casting and bait presentation is that more enhanced. Rods. Any rod you buy from your tackle shop, providing it's 12 or 13 foot, will do for canal fishing. 
you don't have to be a specialist or go out and buy a specialist canal rod. But if you want to specialise on canals, it always pays to go and buy a rod that's got a very soft tip. Simply because, once again, you're not going to catch very many big fish. And there's nothing worse than hooking a decent sized fish on a 12 inch hook length, and all of a sudden your rod proves to be too stiff, and bingo, you break off. Poles. Well, there are literally hundreds on the market at the moment. The short poles I've been using today are standard telesnatcher poles. The end three sections are all telescopic, but the four, five and six sections are all take, put on and take off. Now, I find these a big advantage over totally telescopic poles because it gives me that much manoeuvrability when I want to move out a yard or come a little bit, a little bit closer. As for long poles, well, my own personal pole is quite expensive. It's a browning titanium. But if you are interested in taking up canal fishing, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of poles out there in the marketplace that will suit everybody's pocket. It doesn't have to be an expensive branch of the sport. Right, now let's look at our baits we're going to use today. Firstly, the most important bait of all, the feed. These are squats. They're very, very small white maggots. In fact, they're blown off a very small fly. They're ideal for feeding for the simple reason, as they are so small, they don't fill the fish up a great deal. Secondly, there's the pinkies and our hook bait maggots. In this particular bait can, I have a multitude of coloured baits. All very small, but they're all ideal as a complement for fishing with squat as a feed. There's yellow ones, fluorescent red ones, white ones, and there's even one or two bigger maggots. I don't often use big maggots on canals, but I do find by slipping one onto the hook occasionally, can catch the occasional bigger fish. These, and they're probably a little bit difficult to see at the moment, these are very dark red pinkies. These are my favourite canal bait, and I don't know why, but I do tend to catch a lot more fish on these than any other, any other pinky at all. I do occasionally feed these. I feed these loose feed, especially if there's a fair few roach in the peg. And finally, last but not least, the humble slice of bread. Nothing comes any cheaper than that. It's probably threepence worth of bread there. And believe you me, on this stretch of canal, on the right day, you can catch pounds and pounds of fish on just two slices of bread. A bait not to be ignored. Well, now we've looked at our baits, let's get down to the subject of ground bait. The majority of our fishing today will be taken with actually loose feeding the baits we've just seen. But initially, we will introduce some ground bait to the peg. Let's have a look at what we're going to introduce. One empty ground bait bowl, the two basic ingredients for today. I'm using standard brown breadcrumb. It's quite fine, and once again, it's very cheap. You can buy about half a gallon of this in your local tackle shop for around 50p. On its own, it's ideal. But to improve the basic product, I use this Super Cup. It's manufactured in Holland by Van der Neind, and it adds that little bit of attraction for, to complement the brown ground base. The mix is quite simple. The equivalent of a couple of cupfuls of breadcrumb, and the equivalent of probably a cupful or so of super cup. Mix it liberally, and then add your water. Add water a little bit at a time, because you'll find that the Van der Neyen ground bait absorbs water quite slowly. And you'll find that after a minute or so, it's taken on a completely different texture to the initial mix. That's coming together quite nicely now. A good test for this particular ground bait is, squeeze it nice and gently, and then just see if it fluffs off in your hand. That's quite nice. If you are a perfectionist, then I always like to riddle the ground bait. There's a riddle, onto the riddle, and as we're not using a great deal of ground bait today, this is no hardship. Riddle all the fine stuff through, only takes a few seconds. And there we have beautiful, soft, fluffy brown ground bait and super cup mix. Now this can be squeezed quite tightly 
or very softly, depending on how far across the canal you're fishing. Also, if you squeeze it a little bit tightly, it'll sink quite quickly and break up fairly near the bottom. Likewise, if you squeeze it gently, it'll break up almost on the surface. But occasionally, we want it to break up and cloud immediately. And then, we do another trick, and that's this. We'll take half of that out of there. This is called overwetting. You then add a fair amount more water and slop it round in the bowl. So it comes like a real soupy, gooey mixture. Swirl my fingers, as me towel. That in itself is the mix. Like a sloppy ball. Swish it round in the palm of your hand, launch that into the canal and it will form a cloud immediately. Absolutely beautiful. Guaranteed to catch fish. Right, we're now ready to start catching some fish. Well, I've noticed that the weather's closed in on us a little bit since, since we were showing us mixing the ground bait. But to be honest, I'm really pleased about this. There's nothing better than a little bit of cloud cover for catching fish. It's all well and good going out on nice bright sunny days, but the problem you have is that the fish do spook very easily. A little bit of cloud cover, a little skimming breeze on the water, and I'm convinced we're going to catch quite a few fish today. As a result of the wind change, I'm going to use, initially, the three metre pole with the billy making canal grey. And the reason for this is quite simple. All of a sudden, the top two or three inches of the canal are starting to move a little bit faster than the water underneath. If I was to use let's put that pole down for a second. If I was to use this particular float, you would note the actual flow of the top surface would be pushing the float through quicker than the bait underneath, giving you an unnatural bait presentation. So I would imagine we'd catch far fewer fish on this rig than we would on the rig I'm going to use initially. Plumbing the depth is all important for good canal fishing. More often than not, instead of using a plumb bob, I use one of these non-toxic swan shots. Basically, by simply nipping it onto the hook itself, it acts as a little bit of extra weight and takes the float under if I'm fishing too shallow. To be honest, you don't have to plumb the depth too accurately when you're fishing this method. For the simple reason, today, with, with loose feeding squats and a little bit of sloppy ground bait, we're expecting to catch the fish up and down in the water, not necessarily concentrating them on the bottom. So if you can plumb the depth to within two or three inches, that's quite adequate. I would expect the depth here to be about four, four and a half feet. And the simple reason I think it's going to be deep is because it's a very straight bank and we're funnelling through a bridge to our left. Now any boat that happens to come this particular way will move into this bank, in other words, to get through that bridge itself. I've set this at about four and a half feet, and looking at it, I'm probably about three or four inches off the bottom. Plumbing the depth is all important, but not as important for the particular method in which we're fishing today. The reason is simple. We'll be feeding very, very sloppy ground bait, which clouds on the surface, and loose feeding squats, both of which are very slow sinking. At the business end of the tackle, I have a size 24 fine wire caster blue hook, and I'll be initially loading it with a fluorescent red pinky. It's got to be appetising, hasn't it? Now, my initial gambit today will be to try and concentrate the fish in quite a small area. So, initially, I'm going to throw two small balls of sloppy brown ground bait into the peg to concentrate the fish quite tight. 
and just loose feed a few squats over the top. Now you might ask, why did I use a catapult then? Aye, aye, we're in straight away. All my birthdays will come up once today. First fish of the day, a lovely little roach. By the look of this, it's a superb fish, it's never been caught before. Fins are perfect. Let's just take this little hook out. A lot of people get confused between roach and rud. The roach, there's quite an easy way to tell the difference. The roach has an underslung bottom lip, while the rud has a protruding bottom lip. It's not a great deal of difference, but one that's quite easy to distinguish. Well, that's a good start to that. Let's pop him in the net gently. And see if we can catch a few more. The object of canal fishing is to keep the fishing, keep the fish coming for as long a period as possible. So I've only, although I've only just started fishing inside, what I intend on doing is keep feeding little and often inside. Well, every so often, just loose feed a few squats over the top. And then, if at a certain stage in the day the fish on the inside line tend to die, it's, oh, it's a bit better one. Now this fish is a little bit bigger and under match conditions I would have in fact netted this one because I'm pleasure fishing today and I've been a little, bit, a little bit greedy. I want to catch a bit more, a bit quicker so I didn't bother netting him. Let's drop him back with the rest. Oh. Now because there appears to be a few fish there I'm going to in fact put a very slightly bigger hook on. If we're fishing with a 26 I'm going to put a 24 on. I get the impression we could catch quite a few fish here. When I'm fishing canal matches, I do like to come prepared. In fact, I tie most of my own hooks. There's nothing worse than turning up for a, a nice pleasure session, having a fair few fish in front of you, and you have to spend half the time tying hooks. So I have these ready tied, and it's just a matter of Half a blood knot. I'm ready to go again. Another tiny number 12 dropper shot. I'm putting another number 12 dropper shot about six or eight inches above the hook itself. And off we go again. The fluorescent red pinky. Just clear that little bit of rubbish off the line. And in we go again. Same procedure. A small ball of ground bait. Just roll it round in your hand. So it forms a ball. And right on top of your float. Follow that up. A few, only 20 or 30, loose fed squats. <coughs> Another very important factor when you're canal fishing is to make sure everything is at hand. Take a look, look at my setup, for example. My left hand side, I've got all my baits, my squats my pinkies, a few casters, which I don't think I'll be using today, and my ground bait. Now, I showed you earlier on when I actually mixed my ground bait in here. I don't need a big bulky thing like that next to me, it just gets in the way. So what I do, I just dip a small amount of ground bait into this little container here, and then add the water accordingly to make it into the slop which I require. Everything's nice and neatly laid there. I have my landing necks to hand, just in case I hook 
one or two big fish, and I would expect to catch a few four and five ounce fish today. My keep net is staked at this end with all the top ring exposed. And the reason I do that is simply because being a matchman, occasionally when I do swing a fish in, the thing falls off. I'd much rather it fall into my net than back into the canal. And more importantly, the net is also staked at the opposite end. And the reason for that is quite simple. When you do start to get boats going through the swim, the wash created by the boats can in fact whip your net round and through the area in which you're feeding. And that's the last thing you want, because it'll just wipe your fish out in one foul swoop. On my right-hand side, I have all my rods and poles. There's my other three-metre rig. Be careful of all the grass and that, because you don't really end up snapping your hooks off. My rod and line. My long pole, short, short line rig. And situated behind me, just at the top level of the hedge, I have my pole roller. A most important piece of equipment because it enables me to push when I finally do get round to using it my long pole smoothly and evenly to, to the back of me to give me a quick, efficient breakdown. I must admit I'm really enjoying this. I would expect by the end of the day I'm going to have six or seven pound of fish and it's not going to cost me 50 pence worth of bait. I'm feeding very few squats and just a touch of ground bait at the moment I'm getting a bite every single cast. Whoa, brilliant. You can't beat this for sport, can you? At the moment I'm using a pinky on the hook. In fact, it's a fluorescent red pinky. But when the fish start to dry up a little bit, it is common practice to actually start putting squat itself on the hook. Usually two squats. But at the moment the fish are feeding that well I'm quite happy to plod on do, doing exactly what I'm doing. This particular stretch of canal, I know it's got a, quite a big head of bream in it. No bite that time, I think I'll change my bait. No, nope, bait looks okay. Let's try it just a little bit further out, and this time I'll catapult a few squats on top of where I've been ground baiting. Let's see if that works. I've got to be careful though because by loose feeding squats on top of my ground bait what you might tend to do is bring the fish too high up in the water and as this bottom only rig has got a bulk halfway down I might end up taking up my hook bait through my feed and therefore miss the fish completely so you've got to be careful it's a case of weighing one method up against the other there we go Yes, that's lovely. Small roach. You might be asking yourself why am I using this particular rig as opposed to my top and bottom pole rig. As you might have noticed that as the day's progressed it's got a little bit windier and a little bit more overcast. And the problem is with the top and bottom rig, with the skim on the, on the surface of the water itself, you will tend to find that the float will actually be pushed along by the surface rather than the actual toe underneath. But by fishing a bottom only rig, what you tend to find is that because it's a fairly long float, the float is actually stabilised in the water itself and it doesn't go with the, the wind, it actually goes with the flow of the canal. As a result, you get much better bait presentation. The secret of a lot of canal fishing is to try and keep the canal going for as long as you possibly can. Now I've just dropped in here and for the first time in a while I haven't had a bite almost immediately. Now it's not to say that the fish have gone completely, what's probably happened is that I've taken three or four fish out of the shoal and got a little bit uneasy. So it always pays to keep two swims going all the time. By loose feeding a few squats two-thirds of the way across, hopefully when the inside line dies completely, I can switch across to the rod and line and continue to catch on Mr. Bite that time. Yes, they're not touching the maggot now. They're still there, but they're not touching the maggot. There's a little dab of ground bait. If 
I don't get a bite this particular cast, what in fact I'm going to do is, I'll show you in a few seconds. No, no bite. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push my bulk shot up just a few inches. Slide the three, number eight's up. And move my dropper shots slightly up. By doing that, it gives me a, a slower drop in the water. And by loose feeding the squat, it'll mean my hook bait is falling through the cloud of feed over a longer period of time. Hopefully, enabling me to get a few more bites. When you are fishing for these roach, you will find that they actually move in and out of the peg. Yes, yeah, so there's some there again now, it's two bites. What I'm going to do this time is, the fish are obviously there again, but they're a little bit finicky. So I'm going to put, instead of a pinky on the hook, I'm going to try two tiny squats. And at the moment, I'm fishing a size 24 Drennan Caster Blue. Now that looks really appetising for a roach, doesn't it? Right, let's try this double squat. Little tiny bit of slop. Roll it round in your hand so it forms into a little ball. Plop. Away you go. A few loose feed squats on the far side. Keep both lines going if we possibly can. Let's see. And don't forget if the canal is standing still, there's always an easy way to tempt a bite. Just keep moving your tip slightly only gently just move the tip drag the bait along and sometimes some fish will just snap at it and might be out of anger something like that but it does work let's go back on the pinky again i seem to be just playing with this double squat at the moment let's put a nice big juicy fluorescent red pinky on Ooh. Nice little roach. There's the hook. It's amazing how quick this weather changes. Started off as a bright sunny morning, soon turned round and we've got quite an overcast breezy day now. Yes, we're in again. Whoa, first change fish of the day. A rough, believe it or not. This is a rough, well, we call it a rough in the Midlands. I think they call it a pope down in the London area. Look at the, the back fin, it's very, very spiny. Now, if you're not careful when you're swinging these to hand, they can give you quite a nice little, a nasty little, little jag. But to be honest, they're, they're not poisonous or anything like that. I mean, they are harmless. Nice looking little fish. They look quite prehistoric. Unhook. Let's drop him back with all them roaches we've got. Believe it or not, the sun's come out again now. It's been a real mixed weather day today. One minute I'm getting wet, the next minute I'm quite warm. always keep the feed going in on both lines the secret of canal fishing is try and keep the canal going as long as you possibly can but you've got to keep a little bit of bait going in all the time oh. there we go and another one slightly bigger roach this time on about probably three ounces Yep, and another one. Oh, it's a slightly better fish, this one. I'm going to net this one because as I was bringing it in, I did notice the hook was right in the lip itself. If you try and leave the, lift these out, 
Are there only, t what, three ounces? So I did net that one simply because as, I, as it come to the soft, I could just see the maggot right in its lip. Now if you try and lift those out, almost certainly, it's only just nicked right in the very corner of the mouth. It would have almost certainly fallen off. It would have disturbed the peg no end. Let's drop him back. Put a new bait on. Canal fishing, it's a very simple branch of the sport, but it's very easy to make mistakes. Put too much bait in, and you can kill your peg in no time at all. Put too little bait in, and you end up catching next to nothing. The object is to try and get the fish into the peg, and when the fish are there, just keep them feeding steadily. In other words, create a demand for the feed that you're putting in. For argument's sake, I'm catching fairly well now. If I was to put 100, 100 squats in, that would probably keep the fish or the shoal happy for what, 10, 15 minutes. But by feeding 20 or 30 at a time, I'm keeping the fish active all the time. They're swimming around, pinching fish here, they're pinching fish everywhere. Ah, oh, different species this time. This is a small bream, it's the only one we've caught so far. Evidently there's quite a few bigger bream in this water, up to two pound. Now you can see the difference between roach and bream. First of all, the bream is a much deeper in the body. Secondly, it's got darker fins. And thirdly, the scales are much smaller. And bites appear to be getting a little bit slower at the moment. Oh well, oh, and the fish are getting smaller. I think as a result of that, I'll now change to my rod and line method in an attempt, hopefully, to pick up a few slightly bigger roach. I'd like to just take a few minutes out just to talk about another aspect of canal fishing that's really come to the fore in recent seasons. That is the use of the bread punch. Going back a decade or so ago, this insignificant little item probably won more canal matches than any other method, long before the days when bloodworm really took over on the canal circuit. It's very simple, it's a little brass punch that when pushed into a slice of bread, loads the punch itself with a very small piece of crumb. This then is threaded onto the hook, like so. Believe me, on its day, it's quite unbeatable. Especially when used in conjunction with very fine white ground bait. Now today I've been using ground bait because, to be honest, I've been concentrating on catching on pinky and squats. But to get the best out of bread punch fishing, if you were to use white crumb and bread punch, well, talk about spending a pound for a day's fishing. For 20 pence you can have a day's fishing two slices of bread and a cup full of ground bait and the sky's the limit, you can catch a load of fish. Now, I seem to have drifted away on that line, so I'm going to put this pole away for a few minutes and let's have a little bit of a go, a little bit further across on the rod and line. Right, this is the basic rig. I mean, before I start fishing with my rod and line, first thing I'm going to do is just pull that out of the bus. Now I've modified this particular rod for canal fishing. The last thing you want when you're canal fishing, and sitting down especially, is a long butt to interfere with your body, to start you moving the rod about as you want it. Just by pulling this four inches of butt out makes that far simpler. Another thing is I never use rod rests on canals. Once I've cast out and want to feed, it's quite simple. Just tuck the rod, just tuck the rod between your legs. Nothing can be simpler. Rod between the legs, a few squats into the catapult, and away we go. Right, so I'm going to be fishing again with Pinky on the hook. 
And as I've been catching quite successfully inside on these fluorescent red pinkies, I see no reason why I shouldn't use the same bait over there. Size 24 hook. A billy making canal grey float with all the bulk shots underneath the float and just two tiny droppers down the line, both number 12 shots. Now casting on canals, for some is quite difficult. There's one or two very easy steps to follow. Casting poses many prob problems for the average fisherman, but it needn't. Two casts I'll be using today, an overhead cast and a side cast. I'll go into those in a little bit more detail now. First of all, the overhead cast. This is quite simple. Hold your hook length about four or five inches above the hook itself and just put a very small amount of tension on the tip of the rod. In other words, you're fishing with a reasonably tight line. Release your bail arm or, in this case, as it's a closed face reel, press the button on the front of your closed face reel. And then by just putting the line simply behind you, flex the rod and away we go. Simple. I'll do that once more. Hold just above the hook itself, a little bit of pressure on the tip, rod over your head, and away we go. I'll do that once more. Hold just above the hook itself, a little bit of pressure on the tip, rod over your head, and away we go. The second style of casting I use when fishing canals is for use, really, when there's a lot of overhanging trees and that opposite you. Now, in this particular case, there isn't. So I'll be adopting the overhead cast for the majority of the day. But the side cast is dead again. It's very simple again. Exactly the same as overhead cast. A little bit of pressure on the tip. But instead of taking an overhead stance, just flick it gently from the side. I'll do that once more. Hold the hook length just above the hook, swing your rod to the side, a little bit of pressure on the tip, and away we go. We've been quite lucky up to now, we've caught a few decent sized fish, but the majority of them seem to have come on the inside line. I think they have a slight problem, in fact it's a fair bit shallower on that far line, and although I just had another touch then, the fish seem to be a little bit smaller. With a little luck, if I keep loose feeding, with the occasional dab of ground bait, I'm convinced I'm going to catch a few bigger fish over there. I think there could be a boat coming because it started to tow again. It's just casting again. <laughs> Alright, there's a boat coming through. That's the first one today. I never decry these boats, to be honest, because if it wasn't for the boats, the majority of the waterways, or canal waterways we fish nowadays, to be honest, they'd be weeded off and wouldn't have any canal fishing at all. OK, except the fact that a little bit of a nuisance in the summer when you get literally hundreds and hundreds. But I do very little canal fishing in the summer. It's this late autumn, early winter I find is by far the best canal fishing, for the simple reason you get a few boats just to colour it up and keep the fish active. But the day's fishing generally is perfectly tranquil and you end up with some good bags of fish to boot keep the feed going now one thing I'm going to do now is that although I'm fishing the far bank well not quite far bank, about two thirds across I'm still going to keep feeding inside keeping my options open, trying to keep both swims alive And that wind's getting up again. But the float I'm using at the moment is quite a long float, so it's not been affected by that surface drift. In fact, the float's holding quite steady. Another bite. Another roach. Slightly bit bigger, that one. Starting to build up a nice bag of fish at the moment. There we go again. 
As I was saying, by using this longish float, what basically is happening is that because of the drift and the wind, the top two or three inches is moving along quicker than underneath. So you need a longish float with the bulk at the base to stabilise the float. In other words, the fish should be chasing a bait that's moving when in actual fact it shouldn't be moving. And another one. They're flying at the moment. Keep catching at this race. We could end up with six or seven pound in the net. For half a pint of pinkies and a few squats and a bit of breadcrumb, that's damned good days fishing. Oh, this is a better fish. In fact, he struck and he went straight to me left. Not a massive fish, but one that's well worth netting today. About five or six ounces. Lovely fish on a cold day like today. Dropping back. Right, I'm coming off that for the time being because that wind has got to such an extent now it's even pushing this bigger float along. I'm not quite getting the presentation I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, this small pole rig out whereby basically I can hold the float in the position in which I want it. In other words, as the wind actually blows, I can react against the wind by holding the float in a certain position. This is where the pole rest comes into use. It's quite good that, it's holding really steadily. Again the same principle, tuck the pole between your legs, a few squats. Missed the bite. The principle of this is simply push the pole behind you onto the roller and then push the pole back in the roller itself until you come to the section where you actually want to pull the pole apart. In this particular case, it's third section from the end. Pull the pole apart, drop the pole on the floor, and out we go. Let's have a look at the bait. No, it's not touched. Back in again. Connect the pole, pole in the roller, <laughs> and out we are again, straight on top of where we were expect to catch the fish. Pole between the legs. A bit of feed. First bite on the long pole. It's another roach, I think. Drop us in the roller. This is where you have to take it a bit steadier. Although the elastic is doing all the work by coming out the end of the pole itself, you don't move the pole too quickly in case you do rip the hook out. It's not a big fish, but I'll net it because I'm only on a 26 hook. There we go. Felt another spot of rain there. It's more like mid April than late autumn. 
One thing I ought to mention is when you are fishing long pole, make sure the sections actually go over the hedge are well pushed together. On more than one occasion I've shoved the pole over the hedge and feeding it back only to realise that two or three sections have dropped off in the field behind me. There's nothing worse than having to trapes 100 yards round just to pick up a few sections of pole. And the beauty of this elastic, what happens is in, as the fish runs all that happens is the elastic comes out the end of the pole and takes all the, oh that's a good run, and takes all the shock out and that's in the fish. Yeah and another fish. Now there's plenty of fish over there but the problem I've got at the moment is that the sun appears to be going down and then it clouds over and I'm having difficulty picking out the float. I do get the impression it's, it's dying on me a little bit. Before I put my pole away, in the distance you'll probably be able to pick out those high tension wire cables. If you are pole fishing, especially long pole fishing, beware. It only takes one little slip, pole up in the air, you touch those and you could be in for a very serious accident. Over the last two or three seasons there's been quite a few people seriously injured, in fact there's been I think three or four fatalities up to now. They are very dangerous and very, very slowly British Waterways Board and the people who actually run the certain stretches of canal are banning fishing from certain areas around these high tension cables. But at the moment there's still a lot of cables going over the canals without warnings, so be very careful indeed. For the last five minutes or so, I'm going to have a go on the inside line again. For a simple reason, I can see me float a lot easier. And I haven't fished it for a while, so there's bound to be some fish back there again. Missed him. Thing is about canal fishing, it is pleasure fishing. I've had a super day sport. I caught fish on three or four different methods, and at the end of the day, it's cost me next to no money. The stretch itself is a day ticket water, around a quid a day. I've used, what, a maximum of pounds worth of bait, and I've got at least five or six pounds of fish in the net. The beauty of canals is they are relatively simple to fish. OK, you have to take things a little bit softly, softly, because you've got to realise, with canals, there's very little flow. On a river, for argument's sake, when it's flowing all the time, you can feed wrong for 10 or 15 minutes. You can always correct it by slowing off on your feed because the feed is in actual fact being washed out of the peg. But on canals, whatever you put in stays there. Better to underfeed and keep your peg fishing for a longer period of time than put it all in at once, catch quickly and then catch nothing for the rest of the day. Super fishing, I really enjoy canal fishing. Well, that's got to be the last fish of the day. There's a big black cloud coming in over there and I don't fancy getting wet again. Let's have a look what we've caught. Let's move my stuff out of the way. Right, let's have a look at what we've got. Well, there's a few more there than I thought. That is a really good bag of fish for today. Nearly all roach, all sizes, anything between an ounce and six ounce. One tummy rough, believe it or not, was the only one we caught. Some very small roach, which is good, especially for this length of canal, because you've got to realise here, they're all different age groups of fish. Some yearlings, some two, some three years old, even some that were fry last year. A lovely day's fishing. Well, that was thoroughly enjoyable. Five hours of fish catching. Today, I've caught on three different methods. I've caught on short pole with squat and pinky, and a few on the bread punch. I've caught on long pole on the pinky, and I've caught on, well, to be honest, what must be the most popular of all methods, the rod and line. I've spent very little on base, probably a pound, very little on ground bait, 
And for a pound for day ticket to fish the venue, what can you ask for? A super day's fishing. In fact, you just can't beat canal fishing. Well, it's just one more thing to do. Pop these fish back. Hopefully, they'll all be caught another day.